One, two, one, two, three, four. Before we get started, we want to thank this month's sponsor. Introducing Gong.io, the number one conversation intelligence platform for sales. Gong helps you generate more revenue by having better sales conversations. It automatically captures and analyzes your team's conversations so you can transform your team into quota shattering super sellers. Visit gong.io forward slash sales hacker to get in on the action and see it live. And now on with the show. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. It is your host, Sam Jacobs. We've got a great one today. We've got Derek Grant, who leads Sales Loss Commercial Sales Organization. Let me quickly give you Derek's bio, and then we're going to jump into the interview. So Derek has delivered hockey stick growth and earned the number seven spot. Actually, this is Sales Loft on Deloitte's Fast 500 Fastest Growing Companies by helping over 1,500 companies deliver a better sales experience to their customers while maximizing revenue. Prior to joining SalesLoft, Derek served as the architect of Pardot's sales process, leading the organization from pre-revenue startup to a $100 million exit to exact target, subsequently acquired by Salesforce. Derek is a native son of Florida, holds a bachelor's degree in comms from Florida State, and is supervised by three high-powered ladies, his wife Kelly, and his baby girls Riley and Reese. Welcome, Derek. Sam, thanks a lot for having me on here. You know, this will be probably the first sales hacker podcast that has ever been turned into a drinking game because you're north of the Mason Dixon line. I'm south of it. And so every time that I say a y'all or a bless their heart or reference cornbread based on my, my Florida roots, I feel like uh, everyone should have to take a drink of something. So this is going to be a lot of fun and I'm, I'm excited you'd have me. Well, that's fair. And as a consequence, you know, we're recording this uh, before noon. So uh, we encourage people to wait at least till afternoon before they start pouring themselves a shot of Jameson, which is my preferred drink. A quick counterbalance to that. You can't drink all day if you don't get started in the morning. (laughs) That's a good point. And we can be productive uh, while drinking during the day. You know, it's a myth that you can't be productive. You just got to make sure you have company. So anyway, Derek, you're the VP of commercial sales. As I mentioned, you work for SalesLoft. Tell us about SalesLoft very quickly. Yeah, so SalesLoft is a technology company here in Atlanta that that overlays salesforce.com. And it helps you codify your go-to-market strategy. You know, so often we hire reps who are high D on the disc profile, they're high I on the high on the disc profile, they're dominance, they're influencers, but they miss some of the follow-up, some of the process-centric things. And Salesoft is really there to help you define your play and help reps be able to adhere to it and to be able to drive forward to the thing that's going to drive the most revenue for their business. So, uh, you know, news today, we, we just announced a $50 million funding round from Insight and also LinkedIn. So, so, so powerful. It's a great growing space. It, it is the next have to have for technology companies that are out there. And I think it will move out of the early adopter stage of just being a tech-centric platform and, and move into more traditional industries. But, uh, you know, there's two types of companies, the ones who are going to buy sales engagement this year and use it as an offensive advantage and the ones who will buy it next year who are just going to be playing defense. So very cool space validated by the investors. and uh, I'm really honored to be here. Well, congratulations on the funding. And so give us a rough sense, obviously, you know, the specifics are private and confidential, et cetera, et cetera. But how roughly how big is sales law from an ARR perspective? So we do keep that a little bit close to the vest. What I would say is that uh, that a company's growth tra- trajectory from two to twenty million is one of the number one indicators of how they'll fare in the public market. And I can tell you that we did it in an incredibly fast amount of time. Also, the the Business Insider article that talks about this today mentions eight hundred percent growth in the last two years, and so we've we've had the opportunity to grow at just a breakneck pace. And uh, it's a great testament to marketing, market timing, and a, and a great product team behind us. Well, our, our, and our mutual friend, Kevin O'Malley, runs, runs marketing for you guys. So I think marketing has done an amazing job at Sales Loft. So we will take that to imply north of 20 million, which is fantastic. And then how big is your team? So my team is 50 across SDRs and AEs and sales engineers and managers and so forth. So yeah, good sized team. So now let's hear a little bit more about Derek Grant beside Beyond the Accent. How long have you been in startup land and how'd you get into sales specifically? Because you are, particularly when it comes to like start sales leaders outside of the traditional hubs of New York City and the Bay Area, you're one of the folks that, that a lot of us know about. So how'd you find your way into sales? I'm an accidental seller. There's something to be said for persistence. And so I worked the night shift at a company in uh, Tallahassee during my time at Florida State and did tech support. And from there, I parlayed that into a training gig at the company. And from there, I got into project management. And from there was one day walking down the hallway and the sales manager stuck his head out the door and said, uh, hey, you want to do sales? 
And I was in grad school at the time, uh, getting a, what I'm sure would have not been a super valuable communications master's because we're doing communications for free right now. We're doing it for free. It's, there's no money in it, Sam. <laughs> and so he, he convinced me to take a job on the road. I got a, a, a really primo territory for selling technology. I got the Midwest. So I got Iowa and Kansas, North, South Dakota. I mean, the places where you really think of technology being uh, <laughs> taken up by people and had a great experience. It was, this was Silicon Prairie. I think that's what they call it, maybe. <laughs> uh, there's, I don't even know if there's silicon out there. Just a prairie where corn stalks outnumber people substantially. But what a great uh, learning ground for me. I, I had the opportunity to sell enterprise technology to government, which was a different sort of thing because government buys by RFP. So it's less about just grassroots selling and has as much to do with your ability to fill out paperwork and sort of talk and process and, and rigor. And then I had a really weird stop for one year. I became the chief sales guy at a psychiatric hospital. Wow. And a lot of people have said, I think you actually were a patient there. I was like, no, 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 I was working there. I'm pretty sure. So you were uh, selling crazy people on the opportunity to come to your hospital? That's exactly right. Uh, we, we actually, are, we, it was, I didn't spend too much time with the crazy people, but with uh, psychiatrists, therapists, uh, inpatient psychiatric facilities and was convincing them to send their, their loved ones to us to stay for anywhere from 30 to 90 days. And talk about being heartbroken. I, I, uh, I saw some things that just absolutely still to this day scar me. You know, technology, when it messes up, nobody dies. No families are torn apart. And what I saw there was just, it, I just didn't have the mental makeup, the strength to be able to, to live long in that field. And so in the time I met my wife, met her in drug rehab, and it turned out she worked for a drug rehab and I worked for a psych hospital. So I was trying to get referrals out of her. Most people kind of pause when they hear that I met my wife in drug rehab. You're like, well, because it seems plausible, right? It's like, hey, I've been in drug rehab. I, I've been in a few, uh, never a patient there, sort of like the psych hospital. And uh, I thought maybe you're just an oversharer, and I'm, I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, and into a very real part of the interview all of a sudden. Don't share that. Yeah, that, you don't want to share that. But she convinced me after that year to move to Atlanta, and I was uh, super lucky to have been on Craigslist at the time. Uh, if you go on Craigslist now, you're probably not looking for a job. But it, it, back in 2007, you could find a job instead of like a casual encounter, I suppose, and found Pardot. On there and was the fourth employee at Pardot in 2007. You were the fourth employee at Pardot? Crazy to think about. Wow. Uh, the first non technical. And we, I started there the Tuesday after Labor Day, literally moved my life to Atlanta to be part of this fledgling startup and was pretty sure that we'd be out of business by Thanksgiving. We, people didn't want it. We didn't know what the message was. The product was not feature rich. And we just sort of kept at it over time and we, we grew and Interestingly, and for anyone who's out there right now and, and thinks about the, the role of luck, you know, Good to Great talks about how luck is something super important. The downturn of the economy in 2008 actually was an important reason that, that Pardot was able to be successful because they wanted an eloquent type of platform, but they didn't necessarily have the resource to help. And so you, you take the lemons that come at you and you turn them into lemonade. And so there's you know, some interesting things there that we were able to persevere and endure and ultimately get bought by exact target and ultimately into Salesforce. And I mean, wow, what a cool experience to have seen it from four employees to uh, she's had a team of 200 sellers globally. By the time we got done, by the time I left, it's just incredible to see the growth and they are killing it now. I'm so proud of them. I mean, that's a really interesting story. And there's so many folks that are listening right now that are in that stage where maybe it's not four people, but it's a small number. First of all, it's amazing that as a sales leader, you you made it through because yeah. so many times, you know, uh, every CEO is going to hire an executive coach to tell them that they've got a layer. It's either the executive coach or the investor saying, well, I don't know if Derek's the guy for 10 to 20 million, but he might be the guy for zero to 10. So how did you make it through all of those different transitions? And what are the lessons that you took from the small place where you're almost pre-product market fit to the place where, you know, you're getting acquired by exact target and ultimately running a global team of 200? The truth of the matter is that had we had VC investment, I wouldn't have been able to have lasted the entire time. That, that's such an interesting thing that you think about. As the head of sales, uh, if someone puts in tens or in the case of what happened today, $50 million for sales loft, what ends up happening is they want to bring in someone that's done it before. Well, when you're an unfunded startup, they can't afford someone who's done it before. And so they, they were stuck with me. You know, one of the really cool things they did to get me uh, excited about the company was they built out a plan for me. I remember when I started in 2007, Sam, you're going to laugh at this because it's one month's rent in New York. $32,000 a year, my very first <laughs> year at Carnot, if you believe that. Well, you can stay in my bathroom for 32000 a month. <laughs> I could maybe get a, I get like a corner of your closet. I could just put it up in the corner. <laughs> Uh, and, but what they said was, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to hit this revenue milestone. We're going to hire two reps and then we're going to hit 
this next revenue milestone, we're going to hire four reps. And effectively, they built out the plan that allowed me to, to grow incrementally with that business. So it was army of one. I was the VP of me, you know, the, the chief bottle washer, a $5 title and a 50 cent job. And then we got a couple reps and then we got a couple more and a couple more. And then we got to the point where we needed our first manager. And so we hired, or we uh, promoted Jordan Racky into that position. And we, we hired a few more reps and a few more and a few more. And then we, we needed another manager. We put Adam Dewey in that spot. So we just kind of grew over time. And so, you know, I probably couldn't have done it if, if the me 10 years ago was in a VC backed company and they just invested a lot of money, there's a likelihood that I would have not had the opportunity to have the experience that I had. And so the grind and the heartache and the hardship that we had to endure door as we were competing against Marketo and Eloqua and HubSpot, really, uh, I guess all four actually IPO'd. Uh, to do it as an unfunded company, you know, it was crazy and there were a lot of lessons learned there. You know, you asked about different lessons learned. I think I've found that there's a difference between doing, managing the doers and managing the managers. And that was something I didn't understand at the time, but just the different skill sets. Uh, what, are, what do you think the different skill sets are? Particularly, you know, the thing that was always a challenge for me was going from managing the doers to managing the managers. How, what's your yeah. point of view on that? That's a huge one. I think that there has to be really uh, distinct role clarity as to what it is that they want to do. I can tell you that, uh, that during my time at Pardot, uh, one of the things that I did was was I ended up, I would run the end around of my managers and it's just like such a bad thing to do. But because I knew the reps and the reps come to me and I'd go to the reps and, uh, you know, if there's a deal, I need to know where it was. I wouldn't go to their manager. I just call them direct. And so I struggled with that. And so something we've done at Sales Loft is really focus on role definition. And I owe it to my managers and, and our leaders here to not go around. If I want to communicate something super positive to a rep, I take every right to do that, but I need to work through them. They need to have clear KPIs. One of the things I do with our SDR managers today is they have a red, green, yellow sheet for each individual rep. And what I walk into the every one-on-one saying is, what's wrong? What am I going to be mad about when I see it? What have you already done to fix it? And so it empowers them to be able to make decisions and more keep me in the loop. And if they need help, they know I'm there to jump in on it. But I, I think it's me not necessarily going directly to that rep and put my arm around them saying, what the hell, man? We got to get this done. Come on. I, I need to see more will out of you because you've got zero skill right now. We need to improve it. And so that I'm able to sort of keep my reign, my crazy in, I guess. And, uh, and have the managers really use me as a resource rather than me being the person who's down there trying to make it happen. And it's, it's hard. I read a management book one time. It talked about different leadership style, styles. And I found myself in there. I was the paralyzing manager. And I was so embarrassed when I read it as a crap. What is the paralyzing manager? The person who's always willing to do the thing for them and always ready to give an answer. And what ends up happening is your managers stop being accountable for anything because they know that, that you're just going to go to the reps. The reps can know if you're out of the office and they need someone to explain what to do on a contract or against a particular competitor, they come to a grinding halt. And it's because I was so wanted to help, like I was so wired to help that by helping so freely, I actually really disempowered all the people that were, were around me. So I sort of know my, I know my blind spot on that one. And I, Did you learn that based on feedback or, you know, it's sort of like self-reflection, self-awareness after the fact? I've heard the analogy of plate spinning. You know, the, one of the things that we found whenever, we, whenever uh, I had the team of 200 was one day I was so involved in all the things that my managers would have handled for me. My director would have handled for me, but because I was so intent on being involved in everything, one day the plates just started falling off. I couldn't keep them all spinning anymore. And I think I realized it maybe a little too late when my you know, personal quality of life went way down. I can tell you, I was work every night till 10. I'd drink myself to sleep. I'd wake up in the morning, sit on the back porch, call London, uh, pound a pack of cigarettes. It's just like, oh, I was just a horrible SOB. And it was because of the fact that I tried to be in too many places at one point. So when you ask the question of like, how did I realize it? I realized it when my life had almost hit. It had hit a sort of a professional rock bottom when things were professionally, we were still driving revenue. But man, I just the... Uh, I was miserable. I, I was a miserable SOB. And it wasn't anybody's fault. It wasn't Salesforce's fault. It Pardot's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault but my fault because I couldn't stay in my lane. And I, I wanted to help so much that I was a mile wide and inch deep and couldn't help anybody. I just had become this sort of blocker to things getting done. Talk about reflection. I, my wife works in a substance abuse treatment center, which is back to the joke of many are in, in drug rehab. But I, I think in drug rehab, you need to have a rock bottom. And I can tell you that I, that was a, once you have a, a real sort of moment of, of crisis and just a moment of real strong, it's not even headwinds at this point. It is like a hurricane coming at you. I, uh, I had the opportunity to go back and take a little bit of an inventory. And there's a lot of things I would have done differently. And I'm trying to do them here at Sales Loft, which is be helpful, but not necessarily have to do all the things. Yeah. And I think that transition is tough for, I don't think it's just you. 
I think it's tough for a lot of people because I think sometimes people feel like uh, work is the act of like the tactics is the act of working on the deal themselves or being on the phone call themselves. And when you have to step back and do all of that through the organization and through your management layers, I think sometimes that doesn't feel like work to people and they wonder what they're doing all day because they're in meetings until six and then they go home and that doesn't feel quite as productive as actually having gotten the DocuSign signed. You know, it, you lose the thrill. What's the adrenaline rush is, is being in the room. And, and it's, it is interesting that as you pull back, you're no longer the person leading the group up the hill. You can still lead from the front, but you're now the person who's back a few levels and, you, and you're up on the hill and, and you're able to see everything that's going on and really be able to command the battlefield. But you have to take your gratification from other places, you know, because it's, it's no longer about being the person that helps drag the deal over line. And I think all of us in sales are a little bit of glory hounds. That's not meant to be ugly. And you may say, not me. But I mean, like, it's fun to win. It's fun to be in the room when you win. It's fun to see the lights go on for a brand new rep who can't believe that you said the thing and it worked and here you are with the contract. It's awesome. And it's just, it's, you have to find fulfillment, I think, in other places, whether it's coaching, onboarding, whether it's helping doing leadership development, whether it's spending more time in strategy or even, you know, being locked into a room from a marketing perspective to help refine the message. I, I think you can't be the adrenaline junkie. My ex-brother-in-law was a Navy pilot. And when he got to be 40, you know, he's not able to go out and fly in the squads anymore. So then he becomes part of a training battalion. And then, then he doesn't get to fly anymore. Now he's now the XO. He's the commanding officer. Because you know, over time, the things that you used to do are not the things that you should be doing later in your career. And it was interesting that, that I've sort of seen that happen in my own career. As much as I want to be the adrenaline junkie at the stick driving the, the deal forward, that's not really where I should be doing other things. And then I, you know, is, now I sort of have a desk job. I have a sales desk job. It's cool, but it is. It's a different sort of thing every day. I agree. And then there's some of us where some people get the reverse feeling, which is sort of a weird way of saying that some people feel like they weren't quite ever meant for the individual contributor stuff, but they knew they needed to do it. But they always felt like maybe they felt more comfortable at a desk job overseeing the battlefield, et cetera. You've been doing sales for quite a while. You know, this is a question a lot of people ask, but you mentioned disc profiles. When you think about the qualities of a human being that make them effective sellers and effective account executives, what do you think stands out? So every sales leader out there who's listening to this is going to hire the first D or the first I who walks across because they tell an incredible story. They tell a story about strong arm. You know, the old joke was that, you know, they'd throw their mother down a flight of stairs to get a contract signed. That's your classic D. Life of the party, never met a stranger, your classic I. And those are the people you want in sales. I'll tell you that the best seller I've ever seen operate was a C, was a uh, compliant. And they call it now something different because millennials have ruined everything. Sorry, millennials. Uh, <laughs> they haven't ruined everything. Oh, millennials. <laughs> they're going to amend gun laws in our country. So that's a good thing. Anyway. They're going to amend, gonna amend everything. And, and they truly are changing the world. And, and I will tell you that anybody who doesn't get them should think about it harder because they are, they're purposeful and they're intentional and they want to be connected deeply to things. I, you know, as I sort of kid about the millennials ruining things like you can't call it compliant anymore. They have to call it conscientious. But this guy was boring to watch work. He's not particularly likable. So he wasn't an I. He had some D in him and just did everything perfect. If he told you would have everything by Friday at five o'clock, he had it to you at 430. I never missed the follow up. He was just absolutely incredible. This guy's tripling quota, and he, he doesn't look like a prototype. Someone like, holy smokes, we should go hire an army of C's. And we did. We went out and we started profiling people we're like, I, who wants a seller who's an, an influencer? Get them out of here. And we hired three C's, uh, Brad, Christy, and then we had our guy, Kevin. And Brad and Christy, uh, incredibly, they were so thorough, they would know the name of the person's dog. They knew their favorite color. They knew where they'd gone to school and what the score of the game was that they'd gone to last based on Instagram, which wasn't Instagram at the time, but like whatever. And they'd call and what happened? Went to voicemail. And that's two hours of your day you can't get back. So we subsequently shit canned all of our C's except <laughs> the They were terrible. They were horrible. They're like great for support, great for accounting. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's hire them in our accounting part. They were terrible at sales. Uh, and so, but I, I do think that your D's and your I's in strength finders, they talk about balconies and basements and the idea that if you're really strong at something, that, that there's a blind spot, you don't, maybe not oftentimes realize it. The sort of classic one is like great communicator, bad listener. And so you hire your D's and I's, but you have to be wary of what their blind spots are. They're not a low hanging fruit sort of machine that they're not necessarily super intentional a lot of times. And so love them for what they're good for, but then know their blind spots and be willing to hold them accountable to do the things that will help them be sincere and thorough in their territory and their approach to customers. 
because you don't want to hire C's for sales. If you find one and they're good, they're a unicorn, but you don't want to hire those. You want your D's and I's, but just be honest about what they're bad at. Too. Okay. Well, that's good advice. One of the things that we're not trying to pitch sales loft on this call, but at the same time, I think, you know, when I was down in Atlanta recently for Rainmaker, you guys had a lot of really interesting research about sort of, I guess I call them foundational cadences. Some of like the best practices about how to reach out to prospects, how to get a meeting and how to do it effectively. So what insights have you gleaned from, you know, the labs from the boys in the back and, and the research that you've been doing on the best and most effective ways to get meetings? We have uh, an incredibly bright group of data scientists. Now, they are not going to go out and get a date with someone of the opposite sex, you know, but they will pull a calculator out of their pocket and do a math equation in, in just a split second. Bless their heart. There's a drink for everyone out there. Uh, and so... Uh, I think that's the only... That's the first drink we've had. So people are still relatively sober at this uh, point. You know, I, I, need to, I need to ramp it up a little bit. Jeez, that's <laughs> but yeah, th- those, those guys are great. And, uh, you know, because... Sales loft sits at the intersection of phone, email, social, all these different touch types and touch patterns uh, that people are, are using. Uh, we were able to go in and take a look and we were able to do this thing that we call derived cadences. We have a, a thing that we call our cadence coach. And it's effectively going out and looking at all these interactions over the last four years and, and giving you an idea of what might be an optimal cadence for your business. That's the one thing that on the sales side we encounter. It's like, yeah, I know I need a cadence. Uh, what do you think of this one? It's like, I don't know. I don't know your business. I don't know uh, your buyer. Your messaging could stink. Like, I, I don't know. You know, theoretically, I can tell you that companies like Topo say that 15 touches is the right number of touches, but there's a lot lost in translation there. And so what, what we did is we looked at all these 200 million interactions and we found a few things that are crazy important and simple tweaks that everyone here can make to their cadences in their go-to-market processes to be able to be more effective in their communication with prospects. And, and the first one is start with a phone call. And the very first manager I talked about at Pardot was a guy named Jordan Racky, and he came through our SDR ranks. This is 2008. And he told me in 2008, so fast forward a decade ago, I mean, you've got to dust this memory off. It's so old. I schedule all my meetings via email. They've been saying, for all the leaders out there who are hearing that, I've been hearing that for a decade. And it's like, great, well, if you're doing it all by email, then you've got even more time to make phone calls. But it's just like, come on, don't tell me that. You're telling me you can do it asynchronously, then call, you know? And what, what we find is that making a call and following up with an email, doing a double tap, is the number one highest predictor of a high-performing cadence. And you may say, well, we, we don't like to, to call on day one. It's like, yep, I get it. But what I can tell you is the science says you should. Well, we like to email them first and then follow the email up with a call so they have some context. Yep, totally get it. The data says you should call first. It's not saying you shouldn't do an email and a phone call on the same day, but you should literally just switch the order. And it gives higher connect rates because the person is without context. Now, your rep's got to be ready to go in hot, right? Because the person hasn't seen the email from you to have some context about what it is your brand does. And so you got to be able to go in, you got to be perfectly equipped when you start the conversation. But that is the number one thing you should do. Start with a call, follow it up with an email, same day. And also, and again, he, Derek mentioned it, but we call that in the business a double tap. So yep. that's some inside baseball for you. That is a little inside baseball. <laughs> and Topo talked about uh, triple tap is using social in there as well. And so uh, it, you're just trying to be empathetic. I think that's the thing people don't get about trying multiple channels is don't be dogmatic, be pragmatic. I want to touch them in whatever inbox, whatever channel is the easiest for them to respond because all I want is a conversation. Uh, and so a double tap gives them the opportunity. Look, they can't get to the phone call. Perfect. There's an email in their inbox and you can point back to it or vice versa. The second one was don't be so damn robotic. I think this is a big one. Oftentimes, I, I hear talk to companies every few days who are doing an eight by eight, which is great. And what they mean is double tap on day one, double, double tap on day three, double tap on day five, double tap on day seven. And it's the idea that you're hitting eight touches sort of over that quick, effectively you're spacing it out by one day. What our research shows is you should strive to have 10 touches in the first 10 days. And then from there, you begin expanding out the amount of time between your touches. Because here's the thing, you have come at them like a spider monkey at this point. I mean, if you get them 10 times in 10 days, you are on them like a wet blanket. And, you know, I heard a comedian one time say, I don't know whether I'm being hugged or held down so I can't get away. And at this point, you were holding them down so they can't get away. <laughs> and that's not what you want them to experience, but you're, you're trying to be pleasantly persistent, not like a stalker with their bunny in the broiler, right? And so you have to, you sort of slow it down a little bit. You start expanding the time between your cadences, excuse me, between your touches so that you're giving them time to breathe and you're still delivering value-added content. And you are going long with them. I think that's a really important point. Research shows that the average rep knocks off after two, two touches, so serious decisions. And to be fair, 
That's the average. That means some are doing three and a lot are doing one. And so which, the idea is you, you want to hit them 10 times in 10 days, but then you want to keep going. You don't want to stop at an eight by eight. You don't want to stop at a 10 by 10. You want to continue to hit them over the span of the next 60 days with messaging that is, is broken out, that grows gradually, the intervals grow between, but you're still continuing to serve them and continue to touch them uh, over time. But you, you just, you don't want to be every three days. You don't want to be every one day, every two days. You just don't want to. That looks mechanical and People don't like mechanical at this point. If they wanted mechanical, they'd have marketing automation instead of sales reps. That's interesting that you say that because maybe after the 10 by 10, sort of what you're saying is hand them back to marketing for traditional nurturing. But you're saying maybe there's a difference between kind of marketing drips and sales drips? Yeah, there is. You know, you lose the, the digital fingerprints that you see, you know, the in the from address, the anti-spoofing stuff that says it. Yeah, it looks like it's from Sam, but it's sent by a Marketo mail. And it's like, oh, that's, that's not really from Sam or the unsubscribe link that's in there. At Pardot, we coined the phrase faking sincerity. And I'll tell you that a decade later, I'm a little embarrassed by it. For what, for what faking sincerity was, was it was drips that looked like they were from the sales rep that we'd optimized to look like they were coming from Outlook. And that we were then, you know, people would have a lost deal and we would sort of deliver this impersonal, hey, I know you're using, insert competitor name. Here's some reasons people are switching and just a very, here's a brand new blog post. It's like, it's not a brand new blog post. That blog post is 10 years old. That thing is, is in black and white. It's so old. But if they were sort of these automated programs, what seller, what buyers demand now is, is not fake sincerity, but it's real sincere. What you'll see is if the rep continues to do it, they can continue to personalize. They can continue to be relevant. Like if your reps aren't following people on LinkedIn, they have to connect with them because there is no option for, I'm a sales rep who is stalking the crap out of this person. That's not an option on LinkedIn. But if you follow them and they post something, then marketing doesn't know to say, hey, great article, by the way, loved what you were doing. Uh, I agree. They don't know to do that, but the seller can. And so if you keep it in the hands of the seller longer, it can drive the level of sincerity and authenticity up. Something that marketing and marketing automation just don't have the capability to do. Okay. That makes sense. Was there a third or did I, did you already say the third? The first one was start with a phone call. The second was don't be robotic. Was the third maybe like extended out of the eight by eight or 10 by 10 and stay engaged over a longer period of time? Got to get past the the short burst. There was a research study that was done by uh, sales folk. And one of the things they found is they did two eight touch cadences. They found that 30% of their touches were on the tail, pardon me, on the back half of the cadence. And my perception is had they gone longer than just eight touches, they would have seen even more success. And so I think it's get past the eight and it's keep going to 10, 12, 15, figure out a way to, to keep being in that person's scope of consciousness. That makes sense. I'm curious just about the team and, and you know, getting, providing some market data back to the listeners of the podcast. So you've got a team of 50. How is that broken out? Yep. So uh, a way to think about it is we have 23 SDRs, 23 commercial AEs. We broke those, in, break those into a couple different things. Uh, we have uh, our AE1, which is our promoted SDR. And I will tell you, it's been such a great thing for us because SDRs already talked of the first third of the selling process. And then it's showing them how to disco, how to demo, how to negotiate. It's those sorts of things. But they've been such a great feeder system for us. And we keep them in that AE1 role for six months and we make them hit some revenue numbers. And then we move them to an AE2 role, which has a higher OTE, higher base. And then they're they're off and running from there. So, so 23 and 23. And then we've got one sales engineer. You know, our, we sell to salespeople, so it needs to be sales proof. Uh, and so we don't have an army of sales engineers doing demos. It's our reps. They use it every day and they know how to talk about the value that it provides to our customers. And then we've got directors on the uh, AE side. And so there are first line managers. We, uh, you know, the old LinkedIn rule, we want to give them the most prestigious sounding title that we possibly can. We don't want them to ever leave. But if they do, we want to make sure they're better for having been with us. And then we've got managers on the, uh, the SDR side. So AE1, you expect them to produce revenue and they stay there for six months. Is there a revenue expectation uh, within the first one to two months? I guess my question is, what's the sales cycle? And do you ever see it where SDRs are kind of holding on to opportunities in anticipation of promotion so that they can have a few quick wins when they get promoted? So, so a great question. We actually tell them to do that. So, but it's not hold on to them. So in their last month as an SDR, we then say that you're going to begin getting demo started. And what we're going to do is we're going to let you pick the last five. And so their quote is 15. And so they source 10 for the team and they get the last five for them. And we always tell them like, look, you make it the primo one is meeting number one. You're a long way from knowing what to say to them. And so you got to send that over. And so we believe that's going to happen. We know that's going to happen. So it's like Wi-Fi gravity on that. Just tell them that they will be sourcing for themselves. So our 81s don't get any outbound SDR coverage. 
And from an inbound perspective, we see a lot of smaller companies that come inbound and we want to service those. You know, they're not necessarily our target market, but they are a great learning ground for our AE1s. And so AE1s will get the benefit of inbounds coming in. So they have a 23-day selling cycle on inbounds. So it's, it's super quick. And there's, there's not a ton of meat on the bone. That's fine. It's the, the experience that they're getting is huge. And then from there, we also have an outbound prospecting expectation that they've got to go out. In. And as a matter of fact, our AEs also have an outbound prospecting expectation. So there's nobody at our company who, who doesn't prospect. Our SDRs do it, but they are not the only ones who are out there hustling to make meetings happen. Our AEs own 30% of their own pipeline as well. Huh, 30%. That was the number. That was the, then my next question. And then one of my last questions just on the structure of the team. So one to one is interesting, right? So one SDR to one AE. What's the AE quota? Uh, and are you doing it monthly, quarterly, annually? And yep. uh, is it total contract value? Is it ARR? How are you guys thinking about it? Yeah. And so, so we think about it in terms of ARR and not necessarily TCB, although we do optimize for multi year contracts. Uh, so our reps carry, a, our commercial reps carry a $600,000 quota. And you know, we're not asking them to split the atom, but you know, it's a good size quota, particularly at their OTE. And so our, if you think about our percentage that we spend on sales and marketing, it's well within what the VCs like to see, what the Valley would expect. So that was a quota question. Uh, give me the other one. I'm, I'm sorry. I literally... What's the, so, well, one question is, so it's 600,000, which is 50K a month. Yep. Are the accelerators monthly, quarterly, annually? How do I, if I want to get into the bonus... How have you timed that out? That's a great question. So, so quarterly, although I think on a very monthly cadence, and we've done this all the way back since the Pardot days, I, I will tell you that I think sales fundamentals haven't changed that much in the last decade. Things like, like metrics and conversion rates and, and just how much pipe coverage you need have not gotten dramatically different. So my thought process is it's hard for the rep to make the quarter if they don't make the month. We want to continue to drive every quarter toward the quarterly number. And so, uh, you know, we, I consider it to be a failure if we miss a monthly number, but the reps are incentivized on quarterly numbers. Makes sense. All right. We're almost out of time. So first of all, thank you so much, Derek. You've been amazing. We, we, we like to reserve a few minutes to sort of call out some of your favorite things. So first of all, what's in your tech stack? Obviously, Sales Loft, obviously, Salesforce maybe Pardot, but what are some of the other great tools that you're using to make your team more effective? Yeah. Uh, so all, all three of those are in there, which is uh, very perceptive. i tell you the uh, one that we love is EverString. And so really, really powerful. I, it's able to bubble up companies you should be calling based on propensity scoring. It's able to bubble up lookalike companies. And one thing to help drive relevancy is it can say, hey, you're currently, you know, I'm calling on, on a healthcare organization. So well, here's three other healthcare organizations you work with. So that you can then name drop the old, uh, oh, drop this right in there, you know, in the email to be able to drive relevancy and personalization there. So uh, it's really powerful in that. Vidyard, oh, Vidyard, so good. How much are you embedding video into your cadences? Is it right out of the back? And for Vidyard, you have to, every rep has to sort of record their own video from their desktop. Is that right? So they don't necessarily have to. You can do some marketing produced videos, but I mean, you know, that again can be done by marketing automation. So why do you need a rep doing it? Uh, you know, marketing automation can do it for cheaper and with fewer spelling errors as far as I'm concerned. And so we do have reps record their own video. What we do is we use it as the third email touch. So we send a really personal email one. We then bubble up a reply to that email as our second email touch. And then the third is a video. What we found is that if the reps are on camera for step one, it, it takes a larger amount of time. So I send to research, find something relevant, and then sort of say those words into the camera. So we like going with the personal email first and the video email third. One of the things in that sales law or sales folks study that I referenced earlier was the idea that email one usually has one of your worst conversion rates, but so often we send our very best message of that because the person's never heard from you before. And if, particularly in our industry, they know their sales team isn't reaching out more than twice. So when they get an email and it's, even if it is relevant, they're like, probably not going to ever hear from this rep again. And if you do get them a second time, you actually, that's your highest number of conversions is on the second touch. And that's why we didn't necessarily want to burn a video on step one is that, that there is people are skeptical that you're going to hit them the second or third time. How long is the video? Last question on videos. So the email subject line is a 37 second video for a person and, and based on some research from Vidyard, including the word video in there actually causes uh, open rates to skyrocket. They're not all 37 seconds truth in advertising there. But we shoot to keep them under a minute because it's like, where, where's the person at that they've got time to watch you just opine on and on and on and on and on. It's like, just say something, say, say it uh, concisely. So, something that I heard on a webinar and I will tell you that after 15 years of sales, I literally was dumbfounded by because I'm so dumb. And I, that's what I realized. I was dumbfounded because I'm dumb. In, in step one, 
we research the person and we write a personal email one. And in my world, it was always the voicemail you'd leave would be, hey, I'm Derek with company and we provide value prop. Why not say those exact same words on the voicemail or vice versa, right? And so what uh, Stephen Brody over at MuleSoft, who just got acquired by Salesforce, said he does is he said that reps were spending so much time trying to like make something witty to say or whatever. He's like, just read the, the freaking day one email that you personalized. Hey, I understand you drove revenue by X and it just had a work anniversary. And whatever the compelling events are, just say those words on the video. It's the idea that once you dig up some nugget that you think is meaningful that will drive them to action, use it in every channel possible. And I, when I heard that, I thought, man, I have given people voicemail scripts for years. And how stupid is that? <laughs> say the thing that they said in the email that they wrote or vice versa. Right. If well, I don't, I don't know if it's as stupid as you're saying. I mean, maybe different messages, the medium is part of how you communicate the message. Maybe there's a message in writing that's not quite the same thing as saying it out loud, but I take your point. Who are some of the, your influencers? You know, if we want to go out and go on LinkedIn and find, you know, your perspective, your point of view on the one or two great VPs of sales that you've interacted with. You just mentioned Stephen Brody from MuleSoft. Who else are the people that you look up to in the industry or that you talk about? My spirit animal is Scott Lease. I want to be him for Halloween. The guy is a freaking stud. He is a grinder. He told the story at Outbound Engine that they went from a team of 15 when he took over to three in two weeks because of the fact that he wanted people to be accountable and he wanted people to grind. But at the same time, he didn't just throw them out into the deep end of the pool and then drag a bunch of drowned bodies out of the pool. He spent a ton of time in enablement. Every day, his managers were responsible for enablement daily, multiple times a day to make the reps better at what they were doing. And I think he walks that delicate balance of I expect you to always do more with and let me help you get there. He is a person who demands will and is helping improve skill every day. So I, I love him for that. He is awesome. Is this, the, this is the guy, the SVP of sales from Qualia? Is that That's right? right? Yep. Uh-huh. Yep. He's moved on from uh, outbound engine to Qualia, but yeah, he, he is awesome. And then uh-huh. Mark Roberge from HubSpot. He's of course. An old buddy of mine. The guy is a scientific seller. I mean, he's the guy's, MIT freaking engineer. The guy, <laughs> what the guy's even doing selling is beyond me. What are we, the nicest guy, the smartest now he, guy? Now he lectures at HBS. So it's I know. from MIT. It's always in the Harvard ecosystem. No, don't, don't say HBS. You got to say Harvard. That's Harvard. how they say it. I assume that he wears like a, a jacket with patches on and he's, got a, uh, he's smoking a pipe when he's doing his lecture. I don't know if any of that's true, but I perceive that in my mind's eye. I think you're right. He definitely has a pocket square. He was always very dapper. dapper exactly. And then uh, uh, Bill Bench, you know, I, I will tell you that the marketing automation guys, we all grew a space together and we would have literally done the other one in always, but I grew a great amount of admiration for those guys. He's left, uh, Marketo is now at Pindo and is leading sales over there. But Bill is someone who had a great ability to scale a team. So when I think of Mark as being the science guy, I think of Bill as the butts in seat, driving productivity, a guy who's instant upside from a, a sales perspective. And then Scott is being the person that is just, he's working with new sellers and he is getting them productive. So those guys are all boss as far as I'm concerned. And you, Sam, can I give a shameless plug for you? you I, I, I love a good shameless plug. Do you love a shameless plug? <laughs> oh, we, we have loved you since your time at GLG. But I will tell you, there's nobody better at building relationships, no one better at scaling a team. And so I'm going to put you on the list and it's well-deserved. And so, you know, I will say those four, that's why I'm, I'm really pleased. And, and well, it you. looks like uh, my check cleared this month. So thank you for, <laughs> for accepting my payment. I, I thought and, you were doing Venmo now. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, man. I'm going to throw a y'all in there. So those of you still playing along at home, uh, that'll be a Jaeger bomb. One or two last questions. One, okay. one is you've been dropping a lot of uh, books. So first of all, that's one of my favorite things about any kind of professional. And actually, we were at a fireside chat with the New York Revenue Collective last night. And Bob Nye from JMI Equity was saying, you know, are you a lifelong learner? It sounds like you are. So if I want to be Derek Grant one day and I want to read a couple of books that help shape your professional career, what are some of the books that you want to reference? Yeah. You know, I, I think for any... Uh People have the opportunity way better than me. It's the most important thing. But just some found, I think there's foundational stuff. One that I've always liked is spin selling. I think you can also put into the just sales fundamental books, Challenger. Uh, I think you can also put in there uh, Joshua Principle. I think those are all three books that are sort of foundational from a sales perspective. But I always felt like I hate it when people just read a ton of sales books because here's the thing if anyone had truly figured out the thing, to win every deal, they'd be sitting on a yacht in the South Pacific right now and they wouldn't tell it to you because they'd be afraid you'd use it in a deal and, and take them off their yacht. And so I, I think people who are, who are writing books, they can, you can take fundamental things from it, but I, I don't think that anyone has got the, I'd be pragmatic about the sales books that I read and what I took away from them versus being dogmatic. I don't think anybody's got 
the exact formula. And you think about even Challenger. Challenger was from a time where the economy was in the tank. And so you needed to go in and grab the person by the ears and be willing to challenge. You know, now they have Challenger customer because the market conditions have shifted. So I think so often it's, it's read things, understand them, file them away, access them appropriately, and don't assume that any one person has got the answer because I, I don't think that's true. And then I love things like books like Freakonomics. You know, all three of those books are great. I love anything by Michael Lewis. I'm, I'm uh, listening to The Undoing Project right now, which talks uh, about- Daniel helpful. Kahneman, right? Oh, what's that? Yeah, Kahneman, that's exactly right. The, the Kahneman yeah. scale, literally the way that the, that the Israeli army determined where, what people's strengths were and where they were. The guy's a boss. Yeah. Uh, Have the, you read Thinking Fast and Slow? I've not read Think Fast and Slow. That is one I want to I read. I've got Influence Backing Wolf of Wall Street on my phone right now to listen to. But no, I need to get Thank You Fast and Slow. I've heard good things. Yeah, it's amazing. Two last questions. Life motto, guiding principles, any like one uh, aphorism or something you want to share with the young people out there, how they should approach their life? So we were, I was onboarding reps right before I came uh, and jumped on this podcast with you. One of the things we talk about is, is purpose because our company is a values driven company. We've, we've got our, our five core values and, and, you know, values to a company are like purpose to a person. It's, it's sort of the lens with, through which everything is looked at. And I guess I would say that your purpose will change over life. Seasons of life will change it. But today is the father of two girls under three. Matter of fact, one just turned three last Wednesday, so I guess I can no longer say that. Of two girls under three years and one month, my purpose has shifted now at this point to being a great dad, or excuse me, being a great husband, being a great dad, and being a great leader in that order. But you know, if you'd have talked to me 10 years ago, it would have been to build a great company, to be part of the Pardot experience, to be a startup guy. And so I would challenge everyone out there to think about what your purpose is. And you know, Covey in, in Seven Habits talks about that really what your, your purpose is is you should think about your life, start with the end in mind, and live like you want someone to read your eulogy one day. And I will tell you that I, I hope when someone's standing, the, the next time I wear a tie, because I'm saying I'm not wearing a tie unless I'm, I'm in a box. Uh, <laughs> the next time I'm wearing I a tie. I might make you wear a tie, Derek. Maybe we're oh, going to go oh, geez, that, that sounds constrictive. I feel like I have a really weak person trying to strangle me. The next time I'm wearing a tie, which is when somebody's standing over my, my casket, I hope that they will say that I was a I was great to my wife Kelly, that I was I was there and available for those girls. Cause I mean I could drive toward money and be the best absolute dad in the world and they could have all the things and never have a relationship with me. So I want to do that now. And that's new in the last three years because I have them. And then I, I hope great leader, I hope people will look back and say that I was I was influential in their sales career. I, I always love working with young reps because one day I'm gonna be the person where they're like my first sales manager, that SOB, man, he used to yell at us about so-and-so and I'll be that SOB. And so I'm excited for that. And so I hope that people will, uh, that, that'll be uh, something I'm able to do as well. But I hope that's what they say about me when I'm, when I'm gone. Well, you know, I think it's also beautiful uh, what you just said, just that you put uh, Kelly, your wife above the, I like the order. I guess I'll say that. I like the order because can't really be a great father if you don't have a good marriage and a good foundation. So um, that's okay. inspiring. Uh, weekend, it's, it, it's hard to be there for him. So uh, Miss Grant is the queen of the castle. I was outnumbered at one to one. I'm definitely outnumbered at three. <laughs> yeah, yeah she, she's the number one priority. Mrs. Grant is the number one priority. The girls <laughs> focus on her heels. Well, bless her heart. As that's they right, say. bless her heart. <laughs> All right. So you guys just raised 50 million bucks. I'm sure you're hiring. If people want to get in touch with Derek Grant, what is your preferred mechanism? Can they, uh, how should they reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, you can send me an email. It's just Derek.Grant at salesloft.com. So D-E-R-E-K dot G-R-A-N-T at salesloft.com. Uh, let me know you're, you're looking because man, we are hiring. And so uh, we'd love to have you on the team. We'd love to have the opportunity to chat with anyone in this audience that is doing things to grow their sales career. I mean, your audience is exactly the folks that we'd love to talk to. That's fantastic. Derek, thank you so much. Uh, you've been a, a real pleasure. It's been great to talk to you and I can't wait to see you, I'm sure, in person sometime soon. Done and done. My sister's in the city, so I'll stop by and aggravate you while I'm up there. <laughs> You're always welcome to. It's not an aggravation. Thank All you, right. Seth. Bye. Hey, folks. Sam's Corner. Really enjoyed that conversation with Derek Grant from Sales Loft on the day that they announced their $50 million Series C fundraise. So congratulations to them. I really liked Derek's comments about cadences. I think there's a lot of tactical information there that you can glean. So Derek's research and the, and the research from the folks at Sales Loft tells us that the traditional cadence of an 8x8 eight eight or 10x10 10 10 should continue on past those 10 days or 8 days. 8x8 eight eight means 8 touch points in 8 days, but it's typically 2 touch points on day 1, 3, 5, and 7. 
The other thing that he said very specifically was always start with a phone call. Start with a phone call followed by an email that references the voicemail voicemail that you may have just left. I think that's really good feedback and it's always important to underscore the relevance, the continued relevance of the use of the telephone in setting up meetings and generating interest from the prospects that we're selling to. So never let go of that telephone. The power of the human voice remains strong. With that, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. To check out the show notes, see upcoming guests, and play more episodes from our incredible lineup of sales leaders, visit saleshacker.com slash podcast. You can also find the Sales Hacking Podcast on iTunes or Google Play or anywhere that you consume your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with your peers on LinkedIn, Twitter, or elsewhere. Special thanks again to this month's sponsors at Gong. See more at gong.io forward slash sales hacker. And finally, if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs or on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash and slash Sam F. Jacobs. See you next time.